So here we are. It's time. Let me introduce Dave. Dave Nicolette is an Agile coach. And uh, when I was new to Agile coaching, I was looking for established coaches that I could follow and learn from, especially if their practice included sitting with programmers and programming, because that's what I'm interested in a lot. But especially, especially if their areas of interest are much broader than just that. And so I've been following Dave for a long time now. Um, I'm excited for today's talk because I know a thing or two about Java and some other JVM languages, but I don't know anything about mainframes. Uh, I have developed systems that integrate with mainframe systems, I'm sure many of us have, but I just don't know anything about what goes on in there. It's a blind spot. And so I'm guessing the same is true for some of you here. And this is important to us as programmers, even if we have no plans to work on a mainframe, uh, because it's also relevant to us as regular human people, all of whom probably depend on mainframe systems in our daily lives and will continue to for a long time. So it turns out it's possible to apply modern software development techniques in the mainframe environment. This is what I've heard, and Dave is going to tell us how. So thank you for coming to present for us, Dave, and welcome. Over to you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Well, I hope this will be useful because I've been trying to get access to a mainframe, but I have not been able to. So I'm going to show pictures and talk more than code because uh, that's just the reality for today. I can't get in. So I hope that's okay. So uh, I don't know if everyone else is curious about what a mainframe is or not. I can spend a little bit of time on that and then see how Java fits in. Okay, good. Good seeing thumbs up. Okay. So I'm just going to share, assuming I can find, uh, I'm sure I'm the only one who does this, but I have about 900 tabs open. So let me find the right one. I should have done this while you were still talking. Okay, I think it's this one. No, it's not that one. Oh, sorry about this. This is not good. Okay, here we go. Can you see a, uh, a white slide with black text on it? Okay, then that's right. So a lot of people find the mainframe mysterious. I think I'll cover this and you can tell me to skip it if it's not interesting. Uh, one way you can think of it that's different from most systems is it's, it's not just a single node on a network. It can present itself that way, but it's actually more like a whole network. And we'll see how that's possible on a single box in, in a few minutes. Uh, it supports multiple architectures at the same time and multiple operating systems at the same time. So you can imagine it's sounding pretty complicated already, and it is. Um, so the mainframe is becoming important now, again, for two reasons. <clears throat> One is because these older applications are still running, and they are running like 80% of financial transactions worldwide but the people who support those applications are getting kind of old and uh, most of them are retiring or worse. <clears throat> so a new generation of people is coming into this and learning these languages, particularly COBOL, which accounts for most of the applications. There are a couple of other languages that are used as well, but that one has by far the most market share. So that's one reason for the resurgence and all the training that you've been hearing about, about COBOL is to make sure those systems are supported. And the second reason that it's important is that it it's turns out to be kind of a natural cloud environment. It already has a lot of the capabilities of a cloud environment like AWS. So it, it works in that role very well. So we can see a little bit of how that's true. And of course, as you know, Java plays a role in that world. So that's where the connection is between Java and mainframes, mostly. Okay. So we also have some newer development tools. I'm not really going to demo a lot of that, but I can talk about it. But it looks like uh, IDEs, pretty much like familiar IDEs that you use, like IntelliJ and Eclipse, only therefore mainframe languages like COBOL and PL1. And then they also have 
smarts built in to connect to mainframes and, and deal with that environment. So mainframe developers are now able to use tooling similar to what we're used to. So that helps them a lot because you'll see in a minute what they normally look at when they don't have those tools. And it's, it's not that friendly. <laughs> so let me see if I can switch to another slide here. Okay, so of course you recognize that this is a mainframe, probably just like the one in your neighborhood, if your neighborhood is the twilight zone. But anyway, people find them very mysterious. And <laughs> it's because, it, as I mentioned, it's not like a, an instance of Windows or Linux. It's, it's got a lot more stuff built into it. And I, I'd say that the main reason that they're still around, despite all this talk about them being dead, is because when they were invented in 1964, one of the core design principles was backward compatibility. And the reason for that at the time was every time a company needed to upgrade their computers, they had to get a whole different computer and it had different programming languages and they had to rewrite all of their code. So you can imagine even in those days when they didn't have as much code as we have now, it was already a pretty expensive proposition to do an upgrade. So IBM had this idea, well, let's design a system such that with future enhancements, the old code will still work. And that turned out to be a very powerful idea because you could take a program that was compiled in 1964 on a system 360 and it would run on a today's mainframe without any modification. At the same time, they have incrementally upgraded the technology to take advantage of every new thing that has come along. Sometimes even leading the, the development of new things. So it has the ability to run all kinds of new things as well as old things, old things of multiple generations, all concurrently. That makes it fairly complicated on the inside. So it is a bit mysterious, I can imagine. But if you think of it kind of as a network in a box, then it makes a little more sense because if you consider what's normally in a cloud environment, it it's probably has all of these capabilities, all these facilities available to you for your application. And a mainframe has all of the same things. It already had all of these capabilities because its philosophy was that there is a central computer that manages all different workloads for an arbitrary number of users. Whereas the philosophy in the, the rest of the world has been, we'll have simple nodes that perform one task and network them together. So with this philosophy of the central system that still has to do the same work as a whole network, it has all of these features already. So why not use it as a cloud infrastructure? And IBM is positioning themselves so that they can offer this kind of a platform in the cloud or on premises or a mixture. So it's, it's not going away, it's going the other direction. It's gonna become an important player for larger organizations. Make sense so far? Okay, here's a highly simplified diagram of a mainframe. <clears throat> so at the bottom, I have, I found a couple of photographs of mainframes, current models. So you can see that they are different. There's not just one type. There's multiple types of mainframe hardware. The ones that are the most expensive have all of the instructions in hardware, highly optimized wiring and connections and everything. And that makes them pretty expensive, but it also makes them highly performant and have, have very high capacity. Every customer doesn't need that and doesn't want to pay for that. So, so they have other variations where the hardware is a little simpler. Every instruction might not be implemented in hardware. <clears throat> so there's this layer of code called microcode that sits right on top of the hardware. So if your object code executes a particular instruction in the instruction set, the microcode determines whether that's really a hardware instruction or if it has to emulate that instruction. And so that's done transparently to the object code. And they've gone to a lot of trouble to make sure that all these little 
uh, different levels of abstraction that are built in here don't introduce delay. So you probably would never be able to measure any delay because of that. So they, they've been very careful about how to engineer that. So the microcode isolates the system from the hardware. Right above that is another layer of software that's more recently developed than the microcode. It's called, they call it millicode. This is what enables different operating systems to coexist on the same platform. Okay, so the microcode is isolating the, the hardware's actual logical architecture from the physical hardware. The millicode is isolating each operating system's view of what a computer looks like from the actual underlying architecture of the system. Okay, so then you can subdivide this mainframe into partitions. They're called logical partitions or LPARs. Each of those runs a different operating system or can run a different operating system. And in the example that I have here, I'm only showing four. You can actually have uh, whatever number you can support based on the amount of memory you have and the number of processors you have in your hardware. And these machines, by the way, have hundreds of processors and petabytes of memory. It's not like your MacBook Pro that might have eight cores and you're real proud of that. <laughs> you're looking at a box that might have 200 processors and they think nothing of it. So you can have quite a few LPARs and they can run uh, any number, any combination of six different operating systems. Okay, four of those are the evolved versions of the legacy operating systems. And two of them are new. The new ones are shown here on the right. There is a Linux implementation for this machine. And there's also a KVM, which is a type one hypervisor based on Linux. These two are the basis of IBM's future direction for uh, supporting cloud infrastructures. Mainly the, the main part of their future direction. And in fact, you can even buy a machine that I learned this today that only has those two. I think they call it Linux One. And it's really basically the same hardware, but with some switches turned off so that you can't run the other operating systems. But if your enterprise needs both old and new, you can have that on the same box. So I don't know if you care what all these different operating big customers. That's what ZOS is for. Also the evolved version of an operating system for medium-sized customers. It used to be called DOS. That's not the one from PCs, it's another DOS. It has an evolved form also. IBM also was, a, as far as I know, the first company to have virtualization. So there's another type one hypervisor. It's called ZVM that is the evolved form of that. And finally, there's ZTPF. I drew a picture of it here, but it's not really relevant to Java. This was the old airline control program, ACP. And still, when you buy a ticket on Delta or American Airlines or something, the back end is this, TPF. Extremely high volume, high speed transaction processor. It's, a, it's not architecturally the same kind of a thing as a business computer. It's really a specialized kind of an operating system. So it has those, it has six things. You can have any combination of them that your company needs. And you can combine up to 32 of these, these boxes into what they call a parallel sysplex. And that then operates as a unit. So when I say it's a network in a box, maybe it's a network in 32 boxes, but it's, it's not just one Unix or Linux node. A lot of people might assume it's, it's just something like that, but with a strange operating system, but it's really a lot different than that. Is that making any sense so far? No? no uh, yes, I don't see yeah. thumbs up here, I see. Confusion. <laughs> Maybe a question? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, when you program for the regular cloud, very, very scale horizontally, you know, uh, you have to build some resilience in it. It's a distributed system. Things can go down, come up. Yep. How is it in, in such a box? 
Well, in, in this kind of a box, uh, everything inside of KVM, that's all virtual machines. It can be Docker containers, it can be Kubernetes, it can be all the usual things. What the mainframe has had for a long time is what they call the system resources manager. And by extending that, that the purpose of that was to manage different kinds of workloads simultaneously and assure the best throughput. So originally it was for interactive applications plus batch applications. That was originally what it was for. Now it can manage all of these different kinds of workloads. It still may be running those workloads on these other operating systems and also balancing the system resources with whatever is running in KVM. So you have an elastic cloud environment inside the box. You can kill and start VMs and containers at, at will and expand the number of containers as needed and reduce them as needed. It's just the same as an AWS or Azure or something like that. Okay. And you can have more than one LPAR running KVM. And so and each one of those can have like eight to 10,000 VMs running concurrently. So imagine you had 32 of these boxes and each one was loaded up with like four KVM LPARs. This is comparable to something like, a, like AWS and it's, it's just as flexible. The technology behind it is different, that's all. As far as application programming is concerned, if you're targeting these two systems on the right, it's not any different than what you're right now for, for any other environment. So it's when you need to combine your Java code with some of the legacy resources that the code becomes different. We'll look a little bit at that in a minute, but for targeting these two environments, it's the same. As far as you can tell, it's the same. Okay. So this is what a mainframe programmer traditionally would see when they log in. Now, this is something like a uh, a text-based interface that looks like it's full screen, but it's not really full screen. Anybody use Vim? Yeah, some use Vim. So that, that looks like it's full screen, but it's just the text thing. And this is like that too, it's called ISPF. Uh, I think it's, it stands for Interactive System Perf uh, Productivity Facility, something like that. IBM names things for what they do. They, they don't usually name things after animals and fruits. But <clears throat> anyway, this is writing on top of something called time sharing option or T TSO. This is like a, a line by line editor. So originally programmers had to work on a line editor, one line at a time. Then they came up with this much better. You can edit a, a program. It looks like you're looking at a whole screen at once but it's still not an IDE. It's just a raw text editor behind this. Here's another variation of it because you can tweak it a little bit and make it look a little bit different. But you'll notice on these screens, there's a thing near the lower left called Unix. Now go back to the other one too. It also has closer to the bottom Unix. This is now an option for the ISPF users. That takes you over here to the Linux on Z environment. Okay, and this, uh, this yellow band across the top is labeled overall control. That suggests that this operating system called ZOS takes care of transferring data between these different LPARs. So the other LPARs that are not running the, the main ZOS, they don't know about each other. So your application would not have to know if you were crossing into some other domain, you know, when you invoke a, a service or something, because ZOS takes care of that. It's, uh, there's a facility on the machine called cross memory services. That's what it uses for that. But you don't have to code for that. That's under the covers. It's just interesting to know about, I think. Okay, well, let's go back here for a sec. Uh, normally, the way that uh, IBM likes you to do things with Java on Linux is with Spring Boot. Anybody use Spring Boot to write services? Just one? Well, it's one of the more common ways. 
Uh, that's the one that you would probably use to write services for this environment. And if your target is one of these Linux instances, <clears throat> it's exactly the same as when you were writing it for any other environment. There's no difference in the code. But there's another thing on the IBM system. I'm not sure if I have a picture of it. Let me see if I do. I think not. No, it's called CICS. Let me go back here and we'll pretend there's a picture of it here. Um, this would be under ZOS. There's a, there's a, uh, I'm pushing the wrong buttons. There's a, it's a label there. Uh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. There's a label CICS there. This is an interactive environment for interactive programs. It's what the old time mainframers would call online because they, they coined that term online before there was an internet. So we now we think online means it's on the internet, but in this world, online means probably it's CICS. So it's still in the box. So this is another way that you can provide services. Every service isn't necessarily Linux because this facility called CICS is capable of acting as an HTTP server. So it's also another back end for services and particularly services that need to access legacy data stores like vSAM files and DB2 databases because they don't live on Linux. They live on ZOS. Now you can write CICS applications in Java, but in that case, it's not the same sort of Java code that you normally write. There are two main differences. One is that you have to interact with the CICS environment, which you don't do on any other system. The other is that you have to access these legacy data sets that that's what they call files as data sets. But they have different structure than the files that you're used to because this ZOS environment doesn't have file systems. It has instead what they call access methods. Those are protocols for accessing data that's formatted in a certain way. So the storage device, the disk device doesn't have a file system loaded on it. The access methods take care of uh, storing and retrieving the data in the correct format. So your usual Java IO packages don't work for those. IBM provides another set of IO packages that you would use in that environment. Is that making sense? I mean, it's not any more difficult. It's just a, some different things to use, different jars. Okay. Has anybody done any of this CICS programming before in other languages? No? Okay. So I won't talk about other differences. So another thing that you might need to do is to run a Java program from a batch job. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this kind of stuff before. This is called job control language, JCL. On these older operating systems, you don't have a command line. Instead, you have to submit a batch job. And these lines, each line in, a, in the JCL corresponds to an old punched card. You remember seeing pictures of those? <laughs> or maybe you've seen an actual punched card. That was the standard input device originally with the system 360. And even today, standard input looks like 80 column card images. So that's what the JCL looks like. Uh, this is how you control the machine to make it run programs. Okay. You don't enter commands or write scripts. You, uh, you write this kind of stuff. So in this case, IBM has provided a program. It's called BPX batch so that you can kick off a Java program from a, a batch job running under ZOS. And there's really three ways to do that. That's the thing, another thing about these systems. There's more than one way to do everything. So this program will start this Java, uh, that it's the class there, my class. It's, it needs to have a main method in it. Uh, it'll start that as a shell on the Linux LPAR. So that, that's, this is where ZOS will use cross-memory services to invoke something on another LPAR. So it's gonna invoke your Java program under Linux. It's gonna run it as a shell script. 
it'll automatically pick up your profile. You have to set the class path, which you do down in this other yellow area. And you cannot access any legacy data sets with this job because it's going to run in a separate address space. Address space is another concept. It's every program runs in its own address space. So this is one way of doing that. I know this is kind of a just ripping through really fast and we can't see anything run, so it's probably a little boring, but uh, just to show that there are, there are ways to do this. So another way to do that is with BPX bat SL, which is really the same program, but it's a different entry point into that program. And the parameter that you pass in now, you're saying PGM instead of SH, and you're giving it a class and passing arguments. And this class has to have a main, but it's not actually running in a separate address space or as a shell. It's running in the same address space in a JVM that's that's designed to run inside of ZOS. So they have like three different JVMs. One runs inside CICS, one runs inside batch address spaces, and one is on the Linux environment. So your program doesn't know the difference, but they had to, th those are custom built. So in this case, it runs in the same address space as the job. So you do have, have access to the legacy data sets. But it doesn't know anything about your profile because it's not looking at the Linux environment. So you have to pass in all your, your environment variables, which you do down here in this standard environment. DD means a data set description. It's just one of the JCL statements. There are only like three or four of them. So in this case, you can, if you, you need to access the legacy data sets in a batch program, you can do that, but it depends on how you invoke it so that it, you make sure it runs in the same address space. And that's probably too much detail, but down at the bottom here, this O copy stuff, when this thing is not running in the same address space, it doesn't see the standard input and standard output. So you have to copy those at the end of the job. Otherwise you won't see the results. So it's, you can see that they're taking two technologies that are not naturally compatible and they're, they're wiring them together somehow. And it's not that smooth, it's not seamless. It takes a little bit of effort. So there's a third way. They have a set of jars they call uh, uh, JZOS. And you can run this custom JVM launcher uh, using a JZOS uh, program. And this is called JZOS VM14. Typical IBM name, letters and numbers. And this is going to run uh, in the in Linux. It's it's uh, doesn't pick up your profile. You have to set that. You can access legacy data sets using the JZOS jars for that purpose. And this is another case where ZOS is going to transfer these requests back and forth across the LPARs for you. So, so you've got a, a, these situations are when you have a batch job that's more than one step. And some of the steps are Java and some of them are not. And so you're crossing these boundaries between these LPARs. I think of it also as crossing boundaries between the past and the present in a way, because uh, you may be accessing something, one step in your job might have been written in 1975, and then you wrote a Java program, it's now it extends that job. And, and you know, there are 40 years apart, 50 years apart, it still runs because of backward compatibility. But you can see it's a little clumsy getting Java to play nicely with these legacy resources. You have to pay very close attention to how you code this JCL or it'll go off and do something that you didn't intend it to do or not run in the right place or something like that. So it's a little tricky, not rocket science, but it's a little tricky. Okay, now let's look at some other stuff besides this. I found some references, although we don't have live code. There's lots of a documentation for this system. Have I, oh, screen sharing stopped. Okay, well, let me start it again. There's lots of documentation for this system. 
and you can find explanations and examples for just about anything you need to do. Are you seeing a, a web page that says Java batch jobs on ZOS and OS 390? Is that okay? So, you know, there's documentation of that. I just showed you some examples of this kind of JCL. Uh, here's one submitting batch jobs from Java. Uh, you can also submit batch jobs from inside of CICS and they have wired up Java so it can do that too. You can also start CICS tasks from batch. So there's all kinds of different crisscrossing you can do on these systems. And so there's a, a, a big learning curve. Individually, these skills are not hard, but there's just a lot of them, a lot of different things to do, and they're all very finicky. So, you know, it takes a little poking around to get it right, but you can do that, do a lot of different things. Uh, there's some more documentation. There's the CICS one. Uh, some a Spring Boot tutorial for JCICS is the way that they run uh, CIC, uh, Java under CICS. And you can you see some familiar things here like Gradle and Maven, a lot of it in Spring Boot. A lot of it's familiar. It's mainly when you're accessing the legacy side of the machine that things are different. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. So that's about all there is to that, really. I mean, you, you can do a Spring Boot thing that runs in Linux. You also can do a Spring Boot thing that'll run in CICS. And some of the little things are different, like the annotations you use. And there's a factory class that IBM provides for creating file objects that will help you make sure you create the right kind of file object so that you can access the legacy data sets because they, they're just not implemented in the same way. You know, as I mentioned, there's no file system and that they have the, some of these data sets, the access methods are pretty complicated in themselves. Like vSAN has several different types of data sets that it manages. It's like a little system in itself. It, it's more than just a file. So uh, there has to be some kind of a translation between that and the kind of file I.O. that a Java program would, would use. So ultimately what you get is stream I.O. and record I.O. And it, it's fairly familiar just using different file objects and maybe some of the methods are different. You still get things like read line and that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, that's basically all, all that I have here because unfortunately I can't get onto a live system to show you that, but it would really just look like what you already know. There, there was something that uh, Amitai was interested in that's really not about Java, though it's about COBOL. I don't know if you want to see that. But one of the things about the modernization of the mainframe environment is, well, let me preface it this way. Over the past 25 years or so, uh, we've developed a lot of improvements in the way we work. And, and it started with programming, something like a test-driven development or J-unit or S-unit really, when Kent Beck wrote S-unit. So we're starting from the beginning of the delivery pipeline and year by year, improving the way we do things, adding automation, adding tooling, adding techniques. And we've got, you know, from test-driven development, then we have continuous integration, we have trunk-based development, we have automated deployment, and now things, uh, things have moved into operations where we have observability and all of that kind of stuff happening. The, this may only be me being idiosyncratic, but I see the mainframe world actually kind of taking the opposite path. They had automated deployment and proactive management of production way before we did but they didn't have anything toward the front end of the pipeline. They've been improving the pipeline going backward from, from production backward. And as of today, they're, they're just now becoming aware of things like refactoring and test-driven development. So they don't really have tooling that gets them to the same level of detail with COBOL that we're accustomed to with our languages like Java and Ruby and C-sharp. For instance, you know, a unit test in, in Java is going to exercise one logical path 
through one method. That's pretty typical. We think that's normal. Well, in the COBOL world, there's no way really to exercise one COBOL paragraph. You have to run the whole program. That's as small as you can go. And there's a lot of testing tools available for that, but it doesn't give the COBOL developers the same kind of workflow that we like because they can't get small enough and they can't isolate that code from external dependencies very well. So I don't know if you care to see it, but uh, I've got this open source project that started uh, not too long ago to try to provide that level of granularity for COBOL. So I can show you what it looks like if you would like. I hope they don't kill the screen share. Every time I change windows, they change. Can you see this? This is a VS code thing. Okay. So the idea with this is, I don't know if you're familiar with COBOL or not, but this would be uh, pretty different from what they can do now. This is new. So with this tool, you can define a test case like this that just exercises one paragraph of the program. It does not execute the whole program. So that's what's different about this tool. This is just like calling one method in a Java class. Right? It's a, it, I would say conceptually equivalent. COBOL doesn't actually have methods. These paragraphs are not implemented like methods, which is one of the reasons why there haven't been any tools because you have to play different tricks with it to, to make that happen. You can't just, just implement something like RSpec because it's just not built that way. You have to think of it in a different way. So you can write these little cases, okay? And of course, like any IDE, it's popping stuff up in front of you all the time. But uh, So here, I'm gonna set this greeting type as greeting and uh, Henry is the name. And so I expect that when I say 2000 speak, it should say Henry, that should be the name. And so what a program like that would look like, I don't have the greeting program open. Let me open that. Where did it go? That program just is just this. And this is just for testing the tool. So, you know, it's not really a complete program, but it has these kind of fields in it. There's a name, there's two data areas that, that have similar names. And so there's, I'm exercising these uh, COBOL syntax for, for that, as well as testing the tool. So you're gonna say something like, see you later, alligator, that kind of thing. So that's the code. And the test cases are like that. This is the new part. And then when you run the tool, it generates a program that combines, it interprets the test, generates some boilerplate code in COBOL and inserts that into the program you're testing. Because if you didn't do it that way, the system could only run the whole program. It doesn't know how to just pick out a paragraph. So it generates something like this is some boilerplate stuff here. This is not part of the original program, as you saw. And it's only performing the paragraphs that are specified to perform. So it, it never tries to run the whole program. Okay. The tool also does a couple of other things. It, it comments out all of the IO statements. Because you know Michael Feather's rule that a unit test doesn't touch the file system. So this tool kind of enforces that. It takes out all the IO code from the program that we're testing. So that means you can run it on Windows or Linux or something on your laptop. You don't have to be connected to a mainframe. So between those two features, I think that being able to exercise a single paragraph in isolation and not having to be connected to the mainframe. This enables the COBOL programmer or us, if we wanna work with COBOL, enables us to have the same kind of a workflow that we like for other languages. Very short red green refactor cycles. And then when, when we are pretty satisfied with that, we can upload it and do integration testing and things like that. But we don't have to spend all of our time in that environment where everything is slow. Everything takes longer. So that's kind of the, the idea with this, to, to give us a tool for COBOL that's similar to tools for Java and C Sharp. Uh, another difference, I think, is that the way these test cases look would look very natural for a COBOL person. 
They might look a little strange to you if you're not used to COBOL. But I've found when showing this to people in companies, they, they find this syntax very intuitive and they can often guess how to write the next test case without even looking at anything. And they guess right because it's designed to resemble COBOL. Most of this is this thing that says test case is not COBOL. Uh, these statements here, set, move, perform, that's just standard COBOL. Expect is a special keyword for the tool, but it's kind of intuitive, I think. Expect this to be equal to that or greater than that or whatever it is. And they, they find that pretty easy to use. And I found that when people have introduced test tools for COBOL that are based on the X unit architecture, it's very confusing for the COBOL programmers because what you're doing is overlaying an object-oriented paradigm on top of a procedural paradigm. So when you mix paradigms like that, it confuses people. I don't know about you, but when, when I started to learn about property-based testing in Java, the first tool I tried was jQuickCheck. Have you tried that one? No. Well, it's a port of QuickCheck from Haskell. So you've got this functional philosophy being overlaid on top of an object-oriented world. And I found it very hard to work with. But there's another tool Johannes Link is working on. It's called jQuick. And it begins with an object-oriented mindset. So I find that much easier to use with Java. And I think the same kind of a rule of thumb applies here. This tool goes along with the way that COBOL programmers already think. It's not trying to force them to think the way we do with JUnit or test in G or something like that. It lets them think their own way and work their own way. So I don't know if you're, I, I think that's, that's useful. Oh, you wanna see it run. Here's a results of the last runner here. And it doesn't take too long to run. Let me run it again so you can see. Okay, so it's running, it ran 51 test cases there in a couple of seconds. I mean, compared to the time that COBOL programmers normally spend compiling and testing their programs, that's really very fast. I know it's not quite as fast as a JUnit for, for 50 tests, but it's a lot faster than what you would normally do with COBOL. And it puts out similar kind of output, pass or fail, expected this, got that. And it just comes out on standard out, so you can combine it with other test tools, other output, and maybe uh, send it back to your CI server. We've done stuff like that in some companies where their CI server is not on the, on the mainframe, it's uh, Jenkins or something. And so we would have a job that ran a bunch of tests and then did an FTP to the Jenkins server. And then you could see all the tests from, from the mainframe and otherwise all together. Because you know, if you're going to do a vertical slice, and you're going to go all the way to the all the way through the architecture, then you're crossing platforms necessarily. So you want to be able to combine the output. So anyway, there's that. And I kind of went fast through this because I know you're not COBOL programmers, and I don't know if this is even interesting. <laughs> but, but anyway, any questions or comments? Can you also navigate the code now in Visual Studio Code for, for COBOL? Like... Yes, this tool doesn't do that, but the, the modern uh, IDEs for COBOL do allow that. They support code navigation, you know, finding where something is declared, finding where it's used. They're starting to implement refactoring. Uh, they, they haven't got very far with that yet, but they've started to. You can... Uh, in some of the tools, you can click on the failed test and go back to the line that you were on. So it's very similar. It's a very similar experience. What's different is that these tools know how to transfer the files back and forth between the mainframe and your workstation. And they also give you a, another feature in a panel. It's, it's the terminal emulator. So it, it looks like that uh, TSO thing that I showed you. So that you can... Uh, look at what's going on on the mainframe. And you can also run mainframe-based debuggers 
particularly for CICS. There's one called Expediter. Uh, these tools are really designed for uh, having a continuous connection to the mainframe. This one here, the COBOL check, doesn't expect that. But the IDEs that you'll see, they do expect that. And in fact, they have components that have to be installed on the mainframe as well as on your workstation. And those components talk to each other and they try to present you with an interface that stays out of your way and lets you work on your problem and not have to deal with all the details of file transfer and EBCDIC to ASCII and all of that stuff. And they give you an easy way to submit jobs on the mainframe, things like that. And right now there's four commercial ones, IBM, uh, CA, Microfocus, and CompuWare. And there's also an open source one that's called Zoe, Z-O-W-E. And the way that people use that is they use VS Code and they add uh, the IBM Open COBOL compiler for Z and they add Zoe. And you get an environment that's almost as good as something like Eclipse or IntelliJ. I'm sure that in the next two or three years, it'll be just as good because they're working on it very intensively. So the mainframe is just going to be another platform that we work with. It's not, no longer going to be something way over there in a closed room. It's just another platform. There's a lot of online training you can take if you, you want to start getting familiar with this platform too. And most of it's free. That's, that's in my budget. I prefer Raspberry Pis, <laughs> <laughs> but they are very interesting. Those uh, mainframes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I I have a this Zeb here. I have a question about COBOL check. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it sort of like disables I/O, comments them out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it have a way of faking and or spying on IO operations. This is so far outside of my wheelhouse It's that it is actually funny. Um, so that may be a ridiculous question. No, it's not. <clears throat> I'll tell you that COBOL check is a rewrite of an earlier thing that I think of as a proof of concept. It was called COBOL unit test and it has some mocking features. Uh, we're not that happy with how those were implemented. At the moment, COBOL check does not support that, but it is in plan to add that support. So you would be able to say for such and such a file, when you open it, set the file status to file not found. So then you could write a test case that makes sure your program behaves appropriately when it tries to open a file but can't find it. And similarly, you could say, when you, open, when you read this file, populate the record this way. This is the fake record you want to use, that kind of thing. Is that what you were getting at? That's exactly what I was talking yes. about. Thanks. Okay, yes, that is in plan for this tool. We're still early in developing it, but yes, that's in plan for sure. Cool. Anyone else have a question? No? Well, I think we might be done then. Has Amitai left us? I am here, but I have a three-year-old who's entering hour three of not going to sleep. So <laughs> I'm trying to be really quiet here. Uh, okay. I do have a question. I don't know uh, <clears throat> if you have that's, so I don't have any mainframe experience, but I have worked a little bit with Zen, which I, is a it's a pair of virtualization uh, technology for running lighter weight virtual machines, but uh, more generalized than a container that's specific to Linux. And so I'm wondering, Zen sound with an X, uh, X E N, sounds like maybe it is inspired by the mainframe architecture maybe a way of recreating aspects of it on a, on a PC architecture. Have you heard of Zen? Do you know anything about it? Is it no, like I haven't this heard at all? Of it. 
No. Okay. What is it about Zen that, that uh, resembles the mainframe architecture? Uh, well, in particular, I'm thinking of a, an operating system built on Zen called Cubes with a Q mm -hmm. that uh, uses Zen as sort of a security building block. And it runs uh, lots of virtual machines in different domains in different contexts. Some is for your personal, some is for your work, some is for your, you know, whatever context you mm -hmm. want to make up, you can have. And um, they spin up really quickly. They run in their own domains and then they have really narrow uh, data sharing channels that are, um, you know, kind of like the, I forget what you called it, the memory sharing architecture. Oh, cross kind of memory like services, OS. yeah. Yeah, maybe something inspired by that. I'm wondering Could be. You know, if somebody knew both of them, what parallels would they see? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know both of them. So <laughs> Me, neither. I, so that. I think though that the general the general shape of the problem of trying to have a cloud architecture is probably pretty similar. And people would come up with solutions that solve the same problem. They probably are not radically different except in the details, I would guess. So I didn't mention the web sphere, but I should have. When, you, uh, when you're writing services in Java for the mainframe Linux, you're probably going, they're probably going to run on web sphere because that's the IBM application server that's going to be running in Linux. So that would be your environment. So you'd write your code the same way you would for any other platform that supports servlets. So that wouldn't be any different. But if you were doing it in the CICS environment, then it's a different world. So yeah, I didn't mention that one, but probably should have. It'll be on the test. So I know no one's paying attention now because nobody laughed at that funny joke. I was laughing quietly on mute. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm so, curious if anyone on this call has seen a mainframe environment before or programmed in one, uh, or is just curious like me. Is, has anyone here programmed for a mainframe besides Dave? Yeah, I, this is Paul here. If you've been in any sort of financial realm in your career, you've dealt with mainframes. I haven't done directly too much, but I've done some job control language to um, interact with our Java apps. Yeah, I think it could be useful for uh, anyone who does agile coaching, probably should be familiar with the platform because we always talk about these vertical slices. But to a mainframe person, if you talk about the technologies that we normally use and we talk about, we call them full stack, to them, that, that's like the icing on the cake. And to be a real vertical slice in that kind of a company, you have to cut the cake all the way down to the plate. And so in, in many cases in large companies, especially the financial sector, they introduce agile and it, it never really gets into the systems of record. It never really gets into the core business applications. It's just the stuff on the outside that which is important, of course, but it's not the whole story. So it will be good for us to incorporate knowledge of this platform with our other knowledge. I'll put a plus one on that. I know as a, as a consultant and coach, a very common refrain most places I visit is that sounds great, but it could never work in our context. And mm -hmm. what they don't know, but I know, and you know, is that their context is a lot like the other contexts where it can work. Uh, and their objections are very similar to the other objections. Um, and so any, any information that we can bring with us, I'm thinking about my own practice here, mm -hmm. where I, I happen to know that it can work, even if I haven't been there before, is great information. So this is really arming me if I ever find myself someplace where they say, well, that would never work on a mainframe. Well, actually, maybe it would. Yeah, something that I've found with uh, mainframe developers is that they often spend a lot of time figuring out what the system does because it's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. And where I've seen success is, is coaching them to do mob programming, include the subject matter experts, include the COBOL developers, get everybody in the room. And a lot of that time gets shortened 
because you've got all these different viewpoints on what the bigger problem is, and it's not just these little slices of knowledge working together. Yeah, I, I agree with that. that. I've had that experience as well, that, that mob programming is a great tool in that environment, because like you said, as these systems have been around for so long, and people have, you know, you have to request a project with a budget in order to do anything in these big companies. And so what people would do is work around the system and they'll come up with some point to point interface. that's not on anyone's radar at all, but it becomes a mission critical solution. And so it's not in the company's disaster recovery plan. It's not in their architectural diagram, but if it goes away, you know, five other systems will crash. And this is one of the reasons they spend so much time figuring out what the system does because nobody knows where the data goes, if it's safe to change something or safe to delete something because they don't know where it's going. They don't know the pathways through all the systems. So yeah, that's, that's a, and mob programming has been very useful. I can tell a story if you want of one big bank where a team I was coaching, of course they had the usual siloed kind of structure so this was the team of testers and they were going to do this massive regression testing thing. And uh, I asked them, okay, well, do you have, are you responsible for the entire solution? And they said, no, we're responsible for one application. I think there's five applications involved. So I said, well, how do you know, you know, how do you get your test data? How do you know it's correct? And they were, they mostly captured data from production and modified it but they didn't really deeply understand what was going on. And so I suggested, well, let's get testers in from all five projects, all five teams. And so there were 24 people in the room and it was not a, a textbook mob programming session. It was kind of a collaborative session. And the first thing I asked them to do was just walk me through the path that the data takes from the first system all the way through. And it turned out that there was not a single person in that room who understood the entire flow. Each person knew only their piece. And they discovered in the first hour, they discovered that they could delete part of a data structure, change another data structure, uh, merge two data elements, because before they had been afraid because they really didn't know if that would break something. And now they had the right people in the room to tell them, well, yeah, you, we don't use that data element anymore. We stopped using it. So you don't have to bother with it. You can just take it out. They had no way to know before that. So yeah, I, I certainly am a big proponent of mob programming or in the loose sense, you know, getting everyone in the same room at least is very useful. I'm really glad you mentioned that. I've also found that there's a, one kind of reluctance you have when you try to cut through the whole cake. A lot of the people doing C Sharp or Java, they just think that the COBOL part is gonna to be too hard or too different. And also vice versa. The COBOL people think that this, this strange object oriented stuff is too hard. And when you put them together and they pair together, they very quickly learn that it's not that hard. And pretty soon you've got a good cross-functional team. So there's this conventional wisdom that this is like two completely different worlds, but you can actually learn both. It's not that hard. It's just getting people past their initial hesitation that can be hard. So anyone have anything else? That sounds like silence to me. It do. Uh, I'll throw out there. I noticed um, we were expecting a few more people to show. And I noticed um, during the course of the meeting, I couldn't get to the meetup page for this event at 404. And at least mm. one person on Twitter mentioned that they couldn't reach it. Another person on a Slack that I'm on. So I'm mm. glad that we're recording because we can, we can post it and share it with people who wanted to be here. Uh, yeah. Maybe if they had been here, we could have gotten more questions live, but hopefully they'll follow up with you later. Okay. I think this was an awesome presentation, at least the parts of it that I was able to watch contiguously. I'm definitely <laughs> going to take advantage of the recording as well. Um, thank you again, Dave, for coming and everyone else for joining us. We will have uh, another meetup next month as, as regular, and I'll announce that soon. This video will go up uh, in the next day or so. Um, 
And also, Dave, if you have anything to plug, I know you have a, a similar talk on a similar subject for Kent and Coders later this month. Anything else you want to share with us? Uh, can't think of anything else, really. <laughs> Keep me in mind if you have any uh, coaching to do with mainframes. <laughs> Certainly will, especially after this talk. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again, Dave. That was great. Okay, you're welcome. Nice to see you all. <laughs>